Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Word on the Snakevine. I'm your host today, Ross Deacon, and today on and today on this show we're going to talk all about different things around conservation and community work within the Western world and within Europe. Today I have joining me as my co-host. Hi, I'm Ed. And today we have Sterin from Sterin, Sterin's Wild World. How are you today, Sterin? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm I'm extremely good. I've just had a really nice dinner, so it's really good. Beer in hand, so always makes life easy. Uh, awesome. Un- unfortunately, unlike you, we've got rain here today. So unlike in Spain, Speak where it's probably... Sky here. I don't even know what rain looks like anymore, to be honest. <laughs> That's what living in uh, southern Spain does for you, I think. Yeah. Uh, you get all the cool reptiles there. So I think most people who listen to our show will, will have know, will know Sterin or have heard of Sterin before. But kind of, I think we're going to start from the start for the people who may not. So Sterin, how did you get into reptiles and how did you kind of forge your career in reptiles? Well, to be honest, I have to start with the fact that I love all animals. I'm just a crazy animal girl. Um, I've always been a very shy and introvert girl. So uh, growing up, I was always around animals. I had horses. I had a a rabbit breeding facility. I know super weird, but that's what I did. And uh, yeah, I just really loved all animals. Um, And I had a big... In in Holland, rabbits are quite big, aren't they? Um, yeah, it's a special breeder, like all hairy and stuff, and you can train them. And, you know, this was before social media. So whenever I came to make a deal with another breeder, they expected, you know, an adult person. And then here this little kid comes making, the, you know, these bad, bad ass deals with rabbits. And yeah, it was it was a good time. Um, and that's, that's one thing. I I mean, I love animals more than I love people. And the other thing is that I have a really big problem with injustice. I, I just really feel other animals and people's pain. Um, for instance, there was this guy in my class who had, um, I don't know what you call this in English, I guess a cleft palate. Is that what you call it? When your lip is like split? Yeah. 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 That's what he had, and like they were bullying this guy every single day. But and he, I think he was actually kind of fine. But I would come home crying because I could not handle that. I was like, this guy was born this way. He did not ask for this. It's not important. It's like, come on. So that kind of translates to the whole reptile stuff as well. Like reptiles do not choose the way that they look. I think they look awesome, but many people think they don't. But the it's just, the, it doesn't matter. And that's, I guess, where uh, my love for reptiles came from. Like I saw them on television. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Steve Irwin. And I just loved seeing these animals. And then I found out that many people um, treat them in a way that's not right. And that's why I chose to dedicate my whole life to them. Yeah, and, and I think I think that's how a lot of us have got to kind of into uh, in, into reptiles. I think it's sometimes it's the weirdness around them that really draws people to them, but the, mainly the misconceptions. And obviously, we'll talk about some of your work that you've completed in the community in 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 Holland around around the misconceptions around reptiles and stuff as we go on. So I know that you, after kind of schooling, you went to university and kind of started to work in, in varying different countries on some conservation work and some conservation projects as well. Yeah, that's true. I One of my um, most awesome projects, in my opinion, was when I went to Ivory Coast. Obviously, West Africa is amazing. They have so many cool species of crocodilians. And I went there to um, collect some data and to work with um, uh, Project Messy Stops um, and uh, Matthew Shirley, uh, the owner of that conservation organization. And yeah, we just had an awesome time catching crocs being in the jungle. And after that, I, um, I did some research on how uh, climate change uh, might actually affect um, their, their range. Yeah, because um, I think there's still quite a bit of work going on out in the Ivory Coast, isn't there, around around crocodilians and such forth. And I think for a lot yeah. of people... Uh, New for a species lot of, being discovered, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, when they think of conservation, they think that it's always got to kind of be uh, the field work that goes on with these species. However, uh, I know you've, obviously, as we've, we've spoken about, you've done a lot of work in, in, in the Netherlands. Can you kind of talk us around how you kind of went from doing this kind of this study in crocodilians into kind of creating that the the show that you've obviously produced and the kind of the community work that you do in the Netherlands around reptiles. 
Sure, yeah. Um, so I have two big passions. Uh, one, obviously, is science, and I never want to stop that. I'm going to do a PhD later this year. I'm going to start that, start it. Um, but the other thing for me was always education. So um, being in university, I saw so many professors, many of them being the exact same as I am, quite introverted, quite shy, absolutely brilliant minds, but lots of their research stayed, you know, in the scientific community, which is awesome. But I I've always felt the need to share it with a bigger audience, literally ranging from two-year-olds to 100-year-old people. Uh, people from all walks of life deserve to know about these amazing animals. So besides my studies and besides my research, um, I really started getting into education. I have my own business. So what I did um, is I wrote a children's book. It's called The Big Reptile Book, currently only in Dutch, but um, we are working on translating it. And basically, I wrote the book that I wanted to have when I was a child, and it was missing, at least in, in the Dutch language. And it's just a, a book about everything that has to do with reptiles. Where do they come from? Their evolution? Uh, what does it mean to be cold-blooded? Their skin, their reproduction, their venom. All the reptiles of the Netherlands are in that book, um, just because I want children to know about this. Uh, and that actually grew out you know, it grew much bigger. Like I have my own TV show now. I have an educational theater show. Um, I work for National Geographic Junior. And actually, that's pretty cool because, of course, they always spend some uh, attention on reptiles. But now <laughs> every month they have a magazine and like children can ask me a question that is in any way, shape or form, you know, related to reptiles. And I will answer it in a column. And I think that's so awesome because that ensures that in every magazine edition, there will be something about reptiles, which is kind of yeah. like what I want. Yeah, that, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. And I think one thing that uh, that kind of comes from your story around this is that you've kind of made this passion into a career that's maybe slightly different to what normal people would would think from herpetology and and conservation. You you've kind of come out of it from a, a conservation through activism standpoint rather than a conservation in field standpoint and do your shows show the community that they're shown within the people that watch them that these animals aren't necessarily the scary things that people think they are you know i think i come from the same point as many conservationists but i know that the traditional route isn't working so for me, I look at species that do really well in terms of, you know, people caring about them, people donating money, look at the rhino, look at the lion, for instance. And I ask myself, why is that? And it's because, the, you know, the uh, public opinion on that species is great. Everybody loves lions. They're, they're fluffy. They might kill you, but they don't care about that. But OK. So and. When I saw that when Cecil was killed, this lion that was killed by an American dentist, the whole world was in uproar. Everybody wanted to murder this dentist. And at the same time, in Indonesia, 300 crocodiles get slaughtered because one of them ate a human being, which I'm sorry, they live there. It's what they do. Don't go into the water there, but okay. And nobody even cares. Nobody cares that 300 innocent crocodiles got killed in one day just because of some sort of revenge thing going on. Um, so that's why I, I do what they do. I, of course, I, I love reptiles and I want people to show them that they're beautiful. But the bigger thing behind it is that I want to create some sort of revolution where we change our public opinion on these animals. It, it doesn't matter that I love them to death. You know, the masses need to love them. And that's when more funds will become available for, for research and conservation. And that's when we can really start doing things. Well, I think, I think this is one thing that we, that was, we tried to cover as part of the uh, Herpetofauna conference in the Netherlands recently. That actually looking at a flagship species of a reptile, sometimes it, because of their public demeanor, sometimes is not doesn't give the effect that is needed within that area of conservation. Whereas when you use things like megafauna, like elephants or rhinos or, or uh, lions or such forth, people automatically can, can gain an affiliation with them. But that, exactly. also, that also allows us to pull money into, into conservation efforts for them and their surrounding regions, which in, incidentally can can have a driving effect in reptiles and the reptilian life and amphibian life within those within those regions. And I think it's it's getting people to kind of understand that 
the what comes with the, the this also comes with kind of that if that makes sense kind of that these options are available and um, using these big cuddly pandas for instance is helping is helping save mangashans in in the wild and help help saving yep. varying different species in the wild because we're protecting jungle and and uh, forests and such forth because of that Absolutely, but it also requires from us as, as scientists, as conservationists, to maybe change our message a little bit. What we find interesting about animals is not necessarily what the public finds interesting. So I've also looked at what is it that intrigues people about these animals that I love so much. And mostly it's, you know, things that they can relate to. Most of these animals are mammals, um, have some sort of social life. And those things aren't necessarily highlighted in reptiles enough, in my opinion. So instead of putting, the, when I bring a king cobra onto the stage, of course I tell people, you know, with one bite it can kill 40 adult humans. It's just a fact. But what I put the emphasis on is that it is actually a great mother. Like I wish if I ever become a mom that I become a mother like a king cobra, you know. There's nothing that comes in between a king cobra mom and her eggs. She's very defensive, defensive of them, protective of them. And then the people in the audience, of course, as mothers sitting there with their children, they think, hey, I also love my child and protect my child. And a kid thinks, hey, my mommy takes care of me as well. And then they have something to relate to. Um, and I, so that's and I, think, kind of I think for reptiles in general, that's something that we don't concentrate on a lot, is social aspects of reptiles and amphibian life. Like there is numerous different species of snakes that are, uh, are social by nature a lot of the Fomophidae family for instance uh, live in family groups they will live with one male to several females to youngsters to a certain age and and they'll feed each other and stuff and and none of this is is kind of shown even within the hobby so when people come and look at what reptiles in captivity are generally like or or because reptiles in captivity is kind of most people's kind of view of how what reptiles do and how reptiles are it kind of clouds actually some of these interesting uh, behaviors that, that wild reptiles show because we don't exactly. allow them to show them in, in, in captivity. And I think that's quite an interesting thing that you lead with kind of a king cobra that she will build a nest. She'll protect uh -huh. that nest and then she'll protect the babies for so many weeks. Something that's also seen, uh, I think, seen recently in the hobby, especially around Lachesis as well, that we found that uh, a, a hobbyist has bred uh, a, a critically endangered uh, snake in the, ho in the hobby, and mm -hmm. they've actually allowed maternal incubation, and now is allowing maternal upbringing of those animals to the stage of point which they will leave the nest naturally from their mother. But this isn't seen by the general public and actually it allows the general public to relate to a reptile because it's given them something that a mammal would do or a human would do, but in something that's cold blooded and that's different to to what normal animals are they're used to. And I think that's that's quite an interesting fact that you kind of lead with 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 king cobras, especially. Yeah, and there's still so much that we don't even know. Like, for instance, when we were studying uh, the crocodiles, I was doing the, the climate stuff, but there was another scientist that was um, recording all of their calls. So um, we know that uh, many crocodiles, they live in groups and they have some sort of structure, but we actually think that their vocalizations are um, way more important than we ever thought they were and that they are way more social than we ever thought they were. Uh, crocodiles are also amazing mothers and this is simply not highlighted enough. I think in May there's a book coming out, The Social Life of Reptiles uh, by uh, Dr. Vladimir Dinets. I literally cannot wait to read that you know because there's still so much that i don't know about the social life of reptiles no exactly and i think there's so much to see because uh, i can't remember who it was um they did a talk at the advancing Herpeto herpetological husbandry conference last year and they were talking around uh, the different vocalization of mantellas from captive to wild mantellas and the actual difference in the vocalizations actually was the reason why mantellas were so hard to breed in captivity outside of zoological collections and actually actually the stimulation of adding a wild a wild recorded male vocalization into in into kind of the the stimulant effect 
of the captive animal helped the captive animal breed. And That's I found that crazy. quite yeah, I found that quite interesting because actually what we may be doing when we have an animal in it in a hobby based setting in a in a captive based setting, are we actually removing some of the, some of their natural cues and their native cues and actual their stimu the, the stimulation not only for breeding but for feeding but for other things. So a lot of these animals that we would naturally say are quite hard to keep in captivity actually might be easier if we were to introduce a introduce a vocalization set or a or an ultrasonic set or an ultrasound set or a or a I'm trying to think of the right word but a kind of a, a noise into that environment does that change the way that we keep reptiles and does that change the way that rept and change the way the reptiles in captivity uh, kind of develop and breed and such forth and then again as mammal mammals take lots of vocal cues and it was always believed reptiles didn't and cold cold blooded animals uh, didn't and now it's realizing kind of well actually they do so that's another thing that we can use from a conservation standpoint to kind of say like look they they're pretty much like mammals and all these in these things that these misconceptions just because a spider hasn't got leg uh, sorry a spider's got eight legs or a snake's got no legs actually it doesn't matter it, they what we find works for these set of species actually works for these set the, this kind of different offset of species too and it's, it's really quite interesting some of the things that are coming out especially around socialization and vocalization at the minute that can really help us from a conservation standpoint and actually helping people understand what what's going on with reptiles and allowing people to relate to that as well yeah it's, it's crucial knowledge and and for mammals most for most of the mammals this stuff is well known because they've been so well studied because there have been a lot of money available to study these animals and with reptiles we're just behind and we're only learning now very basic stuff that we already know about mammals for many years yeah exactly exactly so kind of how did you actually get into the show and how did kind of doing these shows and the tv show come about um, I was studying at university and there was this one professor, um, Dr. Ari Talau, and I basically stalked him. I just, every day I had a zoology class from him. I was talking about how awesome snakes are, how awesome reptiles are, um, telling him all this stuff. And one day he said, Saren, you're really passionate about this. Shall we do a lecture together? And then you can bring one of the king cobras. And I said, hell yes. <laughs> So um, we did a, a, a very big uh, scientific lecture. He did the first part. I did the second part. We actually brought a live king cobra to the university, milked it, um, talked about all the cool stuff um, that you can tell about king cobras. And that was a hit. Um, and after that, things started rolling. Um, I got a really good management. And um, yeah, now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, most people's dream, isn't it? To be able to follow kind of that, that path and, and be able to talk about the thing that they're most passionate about on TV to, to a lot of people and kind of uh, around that, kind of share your passion the way that your heroes, when you were younger, shared their passion. Yeah, but I think it's important to know that for the first five to six years when I was doing this, I wasn't making a dime. You know, I wasn't making any money. Actually, it was costing me money to go to all these places. Um, you don't start out with, you know, a thousand people audience. I started, you know, asking um, to people of elderly homes, can I please come and show you my snakes? Um, to uh, schools, can I please come by? And I think people need to realize that um, you might never be lucky enough to make money from it or to be able to live from it. Uh, for me, it took so many years to get there. Um, so many um, things that people might say I missed out on because many people say, okay, I want to do what you do until they learn what it is I actually do. And that is I never go out to a club. I barely have any friends. I barely have any sleep. I don't do a lot of other things that are normal to people, you know, like uh, going out shopping for a day or going to see a movie. I don't do those things. Because this is literally my life. So, yeah, I, I understand that it looks so amazing, and it is. 
but it also requires some sacrifices that I don't think many people are necessarily aware of. No, and and I think that's one of the big things, isn't it? Because I would, I would love to do kind of more TV based stuff. Even though I've, as I said previously, I'm not really got a face for TV. However, <laughs> however, I think the sacrifices that would come with that, like like the sacrifices you do, not necessarily wouldn't necessarily work for me in the way that I like to live my life. And and it takes someone special to do so. And I, and I think that's kind of some of the things that uh, people don't realise that a lot of a lot of the famous people, the famous herpetologists and the famous ornithologists and, and stuff that are on TV all have a very similar mindset to you where it, it's a goal that you, you've reached. However, there has been sacrifices to be able to reach that as well. Exactly, exactly. And I don't think people realise that enough. No, but that, for me, it's totally worth it. Like, to me, it doesn't really feel like a sacrifice. Like I mentioned, I'm a very introverted person. So for me, if you would take me to a club, I would die inside. Um, but I understand that there's people who would love to go to clubs and, you know, go out and socialize. And, yeah, if that's something you cannot miss, then this is probably not, you know, um, your life. The, yeah. Uh, it's a lifestyle, not a career. It's, it's the best way I've found to describe. Kind exactly. Of like towards um working with animals because you yep. make so many sacrifices but you do it for the enjoyment you get out of working with them yeah de definitely i mean um if i did it for the money then i would have stopped a really long time ago <laughs> um no for me it's um the animals uh, just being in a field completely alone you know with a beautiful snake but also the times where i see a very old lady touching a snake for the very first time in her life and i see in her eyes that something changes something changes and this was a lady she is 90 years old and she had dementia and um most of the old people that i meet they are very set in their ways and they think that snakes are very stupid animals but she, all of a sudden, she grabbed the snake and started kissing it. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> you know, moments like that, that's what I live for. And that is actually my money. That's my energy. You know, seeing people change their attitude, seeing animals thrive. There is no, you know, any monetary value that can be put on that. It, it's so fulfilling. No, and I fully understand that. And I fully agree that kind of seeing those those people change or their, their opinions change from just those small interactions that they have can be big and especially in what probably as you probably find in in younger people and then probably the older people that are kind of more susceptible to the change of opinion compared to probably the, the kind of the middle-aged people that are probably quite stuck in their ways in some way. Yeah and that's actually why I focus so much on children because those middle-aged people are the people with small children. So when they go and buy tickets for my theater show, obviously mommy and daddy are going to come as well. And I've had so many parents come to me saying, look, I didn't really want to go to the show. I came here because my son or daughter loves reptiles, but I must say that you really changed my opinion on these animals, and thank you for that. So, you know, people that are otherwise so hard to reach, sometimes you need to reach them through other people, namely their children. Yeah, and I think that makes, uh, as you say, that makes quite a big difference because if the child opinion changes, they start to push more and more about these animals wanting to learn. And then that, that pulls these, these adults and the parents of those children into learning about these animals with the children to facilitate their children's growth. And it can make a big difference in changing people and uh, changing opinions as well. Because I, I remember when I was younger, I, we've always been a, a bird family, to be perfectly honest. And we would keep a lot of, a lot of birds when I was younger. Uh, and then when I left home, that's when I... But I always had a really keen interest in reptiles. However, my parents were always help facilitate the, the learning in reptiles, but would never let me own one. So as soon as I was allowed to own one, I own one, and then since that point on, my dad has been interested in reptiles also. So it's kind That's of awesome. So it's kind of he not to the point where he's owned some, like momentarily owned some, but then things in life have just kind of got in the way, and he's only got a tortoise now. But but still, the kind of that that step change in me owning something to dragging them through to come. I kind of my dad going actually, that's really cool. 
I'd kind of like to keep them myself. And and then him having that kind of animal rather than a feathered animal, kind of that step change in, in his mentality around that was quite was quite interesting to see. And I, I was quite old at that point. I was uh, 18 at that point. So kind of I was, I'd say I was prob- probably slightly older than some of these people that would drag them through. However, I, I do understand I've got friends who have never been interested in reptiles and their children have been inter- interested. And then all of a sudden they've got a leopard gecko or they've got a corn snake. And then it goes from having a leopard gecko to a corn snake to having three or four snakes or three or four lizards. And then kind of the interest in the family grows and it kind of pulls, changes those misconceptions. And, and your kind of things like your show really make a difference because they allow kids to learn about these animals and facilitate the learning of these these animals then which changes the minds which then allows them to to continue that growth yep exactly which is quite interesting (laughs) sorry i thought ed was going to ask a question but he's uh he's gone really quiet (laughs) sorry i was on mute um um, right i'll try again um so your the book you wrote, um, it was aimed at children. Was this, again, through the idea that you wanted something for the kids to have that the parents would be able to kind of interact with as well, as well as having the access to all the information, especially around uh, the native species that you've got? Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it came from the same idea. Also, I already had um, a big children, uh, a child audience, so they already came to my show. So it made more sense to make something for them. Um, however, now that thousands of children in the Netherlands have it on their nightstand, I'm going to make something for their parents, of course, because now they know me and now they know that their child is crazy about reptiles and they're kind of interested themselves. So actually, I just got a new um, book deal. Uh, for a book that's aimed uh, towards adults, um, also about reptiles. And um, yeah, I think it was a smart way to do it because, uh, yeah, the children's book sold very well. It's actually a second children's book coming out in January. And then later next year, the the book for the parents is coming out. I think that would be quite nice for that continuing, the kind of that continuality of, of kind of learning for the parents uh, to then be obviously to be able to teach the children kind of going going forward as well so kind of recently you've kind of moved from the netherlands down into spain kind of have you seen a difference in kind of the the how the community takes this information regarding reptiles and such in spain because obviously in spain there is a lot more diverse uh, reptile life lizards and snakes live in a lot more populated areas than they do in the netherlands has that does that do you find that that's kind of generated a different outlook towards reptiles or not absolutely first of all i am um, i live here partly because my partner lives here but i also still live in the netherlands it's like 50 50 but it's the difference is amazing the netherlands as you know is actually a quite progressive country in many 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 ways um, and Spain is not, it's simply, it isn't, you know, there's things happening here that would never fly in the Netherlands, like the bullfighting or, um, for instance, killing Janets. Who kills Janets? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for me as a Dutch person, this is just like, I'm praying to see one and hear, you know, a hunter will kill it with even out with even thinking about it. So um, it's a big difference. Usually snakes are killed on the spot. Um, around our uh, house where we live, we have the Lataste viper, um, one of the coolest snakes of Europe. And yeah, the photos that we get are of vipers with their heads cut off and um, not very nice images. Um, but that again, I just see it as a challenge. Obviously, I'm still learning the language, which is very important because not many people here um, understand English. Um, but for me, I want to reach these people as well. And I think it's going to be much harder than my work in the Netherlands, but it gave me a good preparation. That's how I see it. Um, but there's still a lot to be done here. I think, you, you, I think, I think kind of, 
I, I was going to go off on a train of thought, and I thought thought to myself, I can't just get out of my head that you just said Latesse's vipers are one of the coolest snakes. When Malpolon lives around near you, I can't, sorry. I'm a big Malpolon fan. It's like my they, favorite snake. Yeah, so. they, <laughs> no, Malpolons, but they are they are very, very common. Um, they are my favorite European um, snake species, of course. They are huge, and we have the ones here that are so brightly blue on the, on the sides of their body. Um, they're amazing, but I must say that slowly people here start to understand that they don't necessarily have so much to fear from Malpolon. Um, yeah. So that's a good thing. But the vipers, they know that they are venomous and dogs get killed. Um, and also the Lathastis viper is stupid. It breeds once every three years and it gets like five young. Cool. <laughs> so... It's, it's a big disaster, but I'm still holding on to saving this damn viper. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually a snake that I've, um, a friend has bred them in, in uh, Germany this year. And I'm, I'm waiting on receiving, uh, receiving a pair, unrelated pair, luckily, because he's had two sets off him uh, of Lataste's vipers this year. No, that's so cool. I'm jealous. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to that. I, I will awesome. chime in here that I do have one at work and they are fantastic <laughs> little characters. Um, when they get grumpy and they start huffing at you, it, it's, it is one of the best interactions I've got with some of the snakes we've got at work. Yeah, they're amazing. Like I have one behind me right now and she just shed. And um, uh, after uh, shedding, of course, they get hungry and she was caudal luring. The entire night, you know, they have this bright, some of them have this bright yellow tail tip. And she was just like luring, luring, luring. And it was just so cool to see that. Unfortunately, a lot of the the native European species are overlooked by European keepers. Um, and we, we miss all these amazing little traits you'll see with, uh, well, Ross with his mouth on. We all know that <laughs> Ross and his mouth on are... <laughs> Are a, a well-known thing that he really enjoys. Species. them. I've got both species. Well, I've got all three species actually. Um, <laughs> Malpolon. Yeah, and you should them. come here. They're so beautiful here. Yeah, uh, I, I would. I'd love a, I'd, I'd love a Spanish uh, locality one. However, they're they're quite hard to come by in the hobby. Unfortunately. And did you know they eat rabbits? Yeah, rabbit kits. Yeah, they 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 get so big, but they're they're so they're huge. actually. They're a social animal, and a lot of people don't realise with Malpolon they um, they pair bond <laughs> as well. So I if you if you pick a male up, a female will be within around about two meters. Um, so you need to make sure you put the male down in the same place you picked it up. Otherwise, that female becomes effectively uh, alone, and the male will actually feed the female and stuff. Oh, so, wow. so yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're a bit of a. Um, a bit of an oddity for, for European species in a lot of ways, especially around social aspects. This is where we were going earlier with the social aspects. But one thing I, I think I feel like um, Europe is very bad at conservation regarding reptiles compared to a lot of other countries. You find in Southeast Asia and Africa and, and the South Americas that a lot of conservation efforts are going on around, around uh, reptiles. However, European reptiles have, are kind of forgotten about a lot in in academic circles and conservation circles and actually seeing the decline in certain things like uh, vipera berus um mm -hmm. obviously the common adders uh, especially in the uk we've got a massive problem with numbers dwindling with habitat destruction due to um uncontrolled burnings wildfires and such forth and then the same on the continent same on mainland europe but actually that's affecting a lot of different reptiles as well. And we're not actually doing much work around conservation regarding these species. Um, no, and, it's and, it, crazy. and it is, it's quite crazy that actually the Europe, especially with how big the European hobby is as well for reptile, for, for her petaculture, for reptile keeping in general, it's quite amazing that people don't realize that our local, our local reptiles to ourselves are in such a, in some cases are in such a decline that we're going to really struggle to keep them and we there's no programs going on at the minute that's looking into this or there's there's very few i should say because obviously there's the vanishing viper group which is looking into viper aberus a uh, reduction in numbers through the years and stuff but but in general there's our european herbs aren't very well looked after from a conservation standpoint 
and and I think that's something that would be I think we'll look more into people will look more into through the years I think because it's on our doorstep we sometimes forget that the animal that's just outside our door needs more help than the animal that's 2,000 miles away from us. And then I think, and I think that's a message that, that we hope that we can help with the show and with, with help and like people like yourself are are trying to get out there that if, if you talk about reptiles to people, they'll go, Oh, what's our local reptile. And then they'll, then they'll find out a little bit more information, found out, find out that the Viper, the, the, common adders for instance for the for holland and and the uk kind of being the only venomous snake that's there kind of find out that they are in decline in both countries so actually let's go and help let's go and do some cleanup of of paths and clean up of these protect these areas let's make these areas protected let's stop dog walkers let's let's go and make sure that we hand trim different bits and pieces of 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 heather and and growth and undergrowth and stuff rather than allowing somebody to burn it to the ground for for con for management of that of that area and help the conservation of these animals in in a more practical way and it, yeah. it, it's kind of amazing actually because kind of i didn't come on to this conversation kind of expecting to kind of go kind of this this way with the conversation but it's quite nice to to be able to talk about these things because we don't get much chance obviously we're very usually venom based as a conversation so it's quite nice for us to to kind of stretch the legs and talk about conservation and especially conservation in community and uh, yeah it's crucial and this is why i added that the dutch chapter into my children's book you know introducing all the reptiles that we have in the netherlands when i did my first tv show i didn't go to bali i went to the netherlands and to spain because the netherlands okay that's where my audience lives spain is where they go on their holiday and I basically showed them in that program, look, when you literally step out of your own house and go into your closest nature area, you will find, you know, the common viper. How cool is that? When you go on holiday to Spain, you know that you can find the Malpolon. How cool are these animals, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's crucial. People don't know about half of the stuff that's living around them. Um, and meanwhile, we're spending millions, this is literally what the Netherlands does, millions to save some sort of weird-ass grouse. That's only three of them are left. It's in a nature area be- besides my, uh, my home there. Millions to, to save, I'm sorry, nothing against birds. But they were long gone. They don't thrive there. They cannot live there. We put all this money into saving this this one bird species when, like you say, many of our reptiles aren't doing well. And most of the people don't even know they're there. And that's tragic. Yeah. And and again, it comes back to this being able to relate, this kind of being able to relate comment, doesn't it? Kind of if people can't relate to what is there to, to a reptile, how will they understand how that reptile is affected by things that they do and things that are going on around them? And it, it's kind of, it always brings it back. And then, so teaching the kids, hopefully the, the idea, obviously the idea with the work that you do, if you, if kids are more conscious of the natural world around them, that will drive the changes in behavior from a young age that then they become systemic, that they become to a point where they naturally will recycle all their waste they'll naturally try and use less less plastic because the plastic in the oceans they will make more of a conscious effort when they're going for a walk to look out for reptiles to try and learn about these animals that are around them and and appreciate and love the animals that are around them because we'll if we have no animals we'll all soon regret it it won't it won't be a case of it won't, it will be quite notable i think especially on some of the areas where we all go walking, especially. No, for sure. And oh, sorry, oh. Carol. Sorry. I was just going to say it's very easy to not realise what's around you, especially when a lot of the uh, the media surrounding the natural world is focused outside of uh, Europe, for example, or outside of the country you're in. So we might look at. Um, uh, a, a nature program that's focusing on predators in Africa. So then you, you've got all this um, ability to see all the information given to you about these animals so far away from you. When, as you say, you walk outside and you might be able to find this really cool viper that has all these amazing traits. It's just you haven't been 
uh, the information isn't accessible, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing that I find very important is not, to not just teach about the, the animals themselves, but mainly their role in the ecosystem. Obviously, I'm an ecologist, so that's my thing. But I've seen that many people literally do not get an ecosystem. They do not understand that basically it's just a house of cards. And if we as people start to pull out cards, everything can collapse. And there's, you know, so little known about the role of reptiles in the ecosystem um, that it's also, you know, a big part of my mission is to help people understand, for instance, some snakes are literal seed dispersers. How cool is that? You think, okay, yeah, he just eats a mouse and he poops it out and that's that. No, he's part of an ecosystem. He is, you know, distributing, dispersing these seeds through, you know, this nature area, thereby literally landscaping this whole ecosystem that you have in front of you. Or um, I tell the story about this lake in Africa where people decided to eradicate the Nile crocodile. Okay, no more Nile crocodiles, but then there was this huge explosion of predatory fish that ate all the little fish. And okay, no more little fish, so the humans couldn't eat the little fish. And the birds, they came to the lake and there was no fish for them to eat, so they also collapsed. Like it's it's a this this cascading effect that is still kind of not in people's minds. They still in the Netherlands they always say humans and animals. But how weird is that? Humans and animals. What are we then? Are we not animals? Are we not part of a system? So that's also one of the things that I that I really try to do. I try to show our native fauna, but also try to explain to people that they are not just that animal. They are a part of this whole system that is in a, in a great balance as long as we don't <laughs> destroy it. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's the bit that people struggle to understand sometimes, isn't it? Is how, how the action we make today can make a difference in another, another animal's or human's life tomorrow. And that's kind of that's the biggest impact that we need to kind of try and try and do with with shows like yourself like with with these kind of conversations that we put out to the public and we talk about kind of the good and the bad there's very the, the work that you do is incredible it's fantastic we're teaching you're teaching children all about reptiles and all about uh, animals in general but then there's obviously the bad side to that where we do have these collapse in ecosystems and stuff but we need to talk about the bad to try and help people realize that the effects that they're having on them yeah so, and hand people the the knowledge that's that's a key thing for me so um of course i tell people about the collapse of ecosystems in my new children's book as well um every continent i highlight what's going on like the bushfires and the amazon um all of the problems that are occurring in those specific areas of the world but i don't only do that i also tell the children what can you do to contribute to making this better what can you do to contribute to the solution and some of the things you already mentioned like you know you can organize a city cleanup with your friends you know come together get your bin bags um, get a stick to get all your uh, to collect all your garbage and clean this place up that's already a great thing that you can do or you know get rid of your shampoo bottles and use uh, shampoo bars instead um, so I think, you know, definitely important to to let them know that things are not going well, but simultaneously giving them very, you know, easy to um, easy to apply solutions in, in their lives. Yeah, it, it, it's a very fun, a fine balancing act, isn't it? A kind of making sure that people understand without going too far and, and, and making them go too far the other way themselves. So kind of what is the you've you've talked about a covenant kind of all the work that you've done and that you've just kind of mentioned there that you've got a second book coming up kind of what other work do you have coming up that uh, around these kind of topics in the next couple of months uh there's a like i said a second children's book the book that is uh, more for the parents um a new theater show where i also um let other uh, scientists and uh, not only scientists actually just people who are crazy about reptiles um come into the show and tell about what they do because for me it's very important that children understand that you don't um 
necessarily need to be a nerd to be into conservation. <laughs> At least this is a problem that I see in the Netherlands a lot. In the Netherlands, our school system is divided into three systems. So higher education, the medium ones, and those will be the managers. And then they literally call it lower education. I, I, I am disgusted by that because it's literally theoretical and practical, but they call it lower education. So I've had many children that were only um, eligible for the lower education, the practical stuff, that said, okay, so um, I cannot do my dream then because I want to work with animals. I want to save the animals. Um, so part of that show is to, um, to show the, those children that are not necessarily good with their, with their brains, but are amazing with their hands, all the things that you can do. You know, when you're not necessarily into mathematical modeling or, you know, all the sciencey stuff, when you just want to be in the field or want to be a zookeeper or an educator. Um, so that's that's what's coming up, um, a new theater show. I'm also going to continue my work with National Geographic Junior. I just got a new contract. So um, lots of cool stuff. And when, once this whole pandemic is over, I hope that I can make some new documentaries with um, the Conservation Front. For the people who don't understand Dutch, I also do stuff um, in English. Um, I founded it with uh, with Jason Savage, a wildlife photographer, and we actually made a documentary about the king cobra, and it's on YouTube. So if people want to see it and see how cool kings are and see a mummy defend her nest, then please watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Um, when, when this episode goes out, I will make sure in the description there is there is links to obviously your bio, your social media, and also to that documentary so that about the King Cobra. So people can see your work that may not necessarily be in, uh, be in the Netherlands and, and had the chance to, to see your work. Because I think uh, a lot of us that obviously live outside haven't had chance. I've got a lot of friends in, in Holland, um, obviously, as you know so kind of i've had chance to see some of this some of the work that you do in in english as, and through the years so it, it's been it's been really good to actually kind of get you on the get you on an episode to talk about the uh, talk about these things because i think a lot of our other episodes have been very academic based or very snake bite based so actually it's kind of saying to we've feel kind of like it's saying to a lot of people that you have to go that route to work with reptiles however as you've said, you, you don't have to. There is lots of other options that you can make a, a massive difference to the conservation of animals and the lives of animals without having to be that academic person. Because exactly. There is so Equally many valuable. Options. Oh, more, than, more so in a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just a shame that, you know, for, for many people, they feel like the doors are closing, their their dream is gone, just because they're shitty at, at mathematics. No, if you have the passion, I'm sure you have a lot of other talents that you can use in, in the field of conservation. We don't only need scientists, that would be a very sad world. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that actually is quite a really nice place to kind of leave the episode on, on such a high and kind of, and and that piece of information that for our listeners that to be able to work within herpetology and conservation, you don't need to be an academic. So I'd just like to thank you, Sterin, for coming onto the episode and, and joining us today for this conversation. I've I've had a really good time. It's been it's been really nice to be able to, to talk about topics that we don't know, normally talk about on this on this podcast. So it's been really nice to do so. So thank you for joining thank us. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honour. It's uh, it's genuinely an absolute pleasure. And I'd just like to thank our listeners for, for listening to us once again. And please do leave a review on our social medias or your podcasting platform so that we know if what we're doing, if it's right for you, if you, other guests that you may want to hear from and other and if you would like us to take up other kind of activities as well uh, that will allow the kind of the learning of our listeners as well as help within other areas also. So thank you and good night. <laughs>